to cancel all graphs that contribute to vacuum ui of infinity minus infinity vacuum. That means in a general theory, since this is, of course, the sum of all connected graphs with no external lines, okay, or the exponential of that sum, I should say exponential sum graphs Okay, that's our theorem that the sum of all, of all Wick diagrams is the uh, exponential, the sum of the connected Wick diagrams. And obviously, the only connected diagrams that will not annihilate the, the vacuum either on the right or on the left are those with no external lines. The uh, counter term must be chosen to cancel the sum. In principle, in a general theory, that means that it will be an infinite power series in the coupling constant or coupling constants of the theory because there will be an infinite number of such graphs. However, in the particular model in question, there was only one graph without external lines before we introduced the counter term. This one, only one connected graph, I should say. Only one connected graph without external lines. And uh, therefore, after we have added the counter term, there are two, this graph and the counter term itself, and their sum must be 0. Is that a satisfactory answer? Well, when you, when you define it, you put it, um, OK, it just looks like when you define it, you put it in the count, the cancel. Um, put it in to cancel a phase shift that was due to a, a um, no, I shouldn't say a phase shift, a phase, period. You cancel a phase that was due to uh, uh, energy mismatch between the states before, the ground state before we turned on the interaction and the ground state after we turned on the interaction. The reason that energy mismatch was bothersome was that it did not make this quantity equal one. So we have two equivalent ways of describing the same counter term. It cancels the energy mismatch, and it makes this U matrix element equal to 1. Since our perturbation theory is set up to compute U matrix elements, the second definition is obviously the best one to use if we wish to compute the counter term. On the other hand, the first one is also useful, because after we've computed it, we can give it a definite physical meaning. Does that answer your question? Uh, yes, sir. This is done, but why exactly does that thing have to occur? Well, um, if the, the real theory we're talking about is a translationally invariant theory, we should expect it to have a unique ground state, at least if, uh, you know, if the system looks at all like the free system in the crudest way, to have a unique ground state. If I, if I ask the question, if I start out at a little time far in the past and I have an empty box with a static source sitting in it, and then I go in the far future, what state do I find? The answer is the same state, since there's nothing in the box that can do anything. And therefore, uh, and therefore we expect the vacuum to vacuum S matrix element to be one. Okay. That's the ground state. It doesn't do anything. It just lies there. Quick diagram associated with the exponential operator, uh, mm -hmm. the interaction operator. Yeah. And in the case we had the interaction operator was equal to uh, the G times phi. Mm -hmm. Now the question is, you said earlier that phi was phi interaction, mm -hmm. which means that we should take the uh, normal perturbation to the to the normal Hamiltonian bracket with the IHRT and the minus IHRT. Yes, but yes, but that's what HI is. HI is e to the um, which side does it go on? equals the same function h prime of pi, qi, and t. OK. Therefore, if h prime in uh, Schrodinger picture, 
say is or I'll write the density just to avoid writing integral signs equals g psi bar psi phi f of t okay yeah h prime i and just since I, more, I just adopted a notational convention that may have confused you since everything was a phi i or a psi i, I just dropped the i's for convenience. Well, that's not the problem. When you started to make calculations, you put it, you substituted for the phi. You substituted the normal free field result. That's right. That's because the interaction picture uh, uh, fields obey the free equations of motion. And the, of course, the canonical commutators, that's true in every picture, so they have an expansion in terms of creation and annihilation operators. The Heisenberg fields in general do not, but they have an expansion that's just like a free field expansion in terms of creation and annihilation operators. Because they obey the free field equations of motion. Uh, no, something is obviously puzzling Yeah, me. I know. It's just that the, it's hard to put my finger on one. I mean, that's what I thought before, but it didn't, I mean, I didn't say, ah, now I understand. Okay, well, maybe you can think about it and you come and talk to me privately or in another lecture if you can formulate your question better. Or if you can even only formulate it vaguely, come and talk with me privately and we'll, we'll try and figure out what's bothering you. Now, I now um, want to go um, to consider our third model. And there are uh, two, new two new features that come up here. One is that um, the, our, there are uh, new problems arising uh, uh, in the same way that the energy shift problem arose last lecture. And these problems are subsumed under the name of mass renormalization. Mass renormalization is unfortunately a word used in two senses. It is used both for the phenomenon that occurs, we say that's mass renormalization, and for the prescription we use to take account of the phenomena, which is a prescription for adding counter terms. So the Lagrangian is a peculiar situa linguistic situation in which the disease and the cure have the same name. <laughs> the, uh, the second um, thing is that, of course, here our, fine, our uh, WIC graphs will not have um, the uh, extraordinarily simple a structure they had in the previous case. Indeed, one does not have just a finite family of connected with graphs, but an infinite family. And therefore, we have no hope of computing the S matrix in closed form, as we did for the previous two examples, at least not by these methods, nor by any methods known to man or woman. <laughs> I will not speak about alien life forms. They may be clever. The, 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 uh, the, uh, and therefore, um, all we can do is settle down at a particular matrix element for a particular scattering process and compute it out order by order in perturbation theory until we reach the limits of our computational abilities. And um, therefore, it was convenient to use not WIC graphs, another kind of graph that represents the contribution of a WIC operator to a uh, particular matrix element obtained rather trivially from a WIC graph. And that will lead me to the topic of Feynman graphs. These two topics will occupy this lecture, and I'd first like to begin by discussing mass renormalization. The subject has an interesting history. Um, let me begin with a balloon, or actually a rigid sphere, a rigid sphere in a, immersed in a fluid. A problem considered by uh, George Green of Manchester, he for whom Green's functions are named, in the 1830s, and he published the results of his investigation in the transactions of the Edinburgh Academy of Sciences at that time. 
And Green's, uh, Green's uh, re uh, problem could be uh, phrases, phrased in the following way. Suppose I have a uh, rigid sphere, say a balloon filled with or a, uh, a zeppelin, filled spherical zeppelin filled with, uh, filled with hydrogen or some other very density of the fluid, and this is the volume of the sphere. Now, if we do an elementary statics calculation on this object, there is a gravitational force pulling downwards, which is M0g. There is an Archimedean buoyancy force pulling upwards, which is 10M0g. And therefore, the acceleration observed by the object upwards, if we let go of it, is its mass over the net force, or 9 times g. Now, if you've ever let go of a balloon, well, a balloon, you usually don't get a 10 to 1 ratio with a toy balloon that's filled with helium. But if you ever let go of a ping pong ball, which you have held under a, on the bottom of a swimming pool or in a sink, you will observe that this is grossly false. It does not go up with 9g acceleration. Uh, you might at first glance say that this is a, um, effect is ascribed to uh, friction, but that can't be so during the early stages of the motion because you know all frictional forces are proportional to the velocity. So until the system builds up some substantial velocity, friction cannot be important. It's important in the late stages of the motion when the ping pong ball attains terminal velocity, but not in the early stages. Um, Green um, wrote a paper called On the Vibrations of a Spherical Pendulum Immersed in a Perfect Fluid. And he discovered, he was just doing a small vibration problem, which would be good enough for the early stages of the motion. And he observed the remarkable result, which I think I can almost see. He said, the um, pendulum moves as it would were it in vacua, save that its mass is augmented by an amount equal to half the mass of the fluid displaced. That is to say, Green said that there was actually an effective mass, what we might call the physical mass, the only mass we could measure if we couldn't take the the uh, ping pong ball out of the water if the universe were filled with water. And that effective mass plus one half rho v. The physical explanation for this phenomena, which Green just obtained by solving the linearized equations, was pointed out a decade later in a review article by Stokes, who also is known to you as the uh, inventor of Stokes' theorem. And Stokes pointed out that if you uh, imagine a rigid sphere moving through a fluid with some velocity v, um, then, um, of course, the fluid, perfect fluid, doesn't, uh, doesn't just stand there. It can't because it's got to move to get around the sphere. And as you know, there is a pattern of flow set up in the fluid which most of you have solved for in elementary courses of one kind or another. And therefore, if we were to calculate the momentum of this equilibrium configuration, we would find that the momentum is M0V plus the fluid momentum, which you compute just by taking this classic problem solution and, um, and uh, everyone knows the answer. It's the it's uh, expressed in terms of the first Legendre polynomial only, as I recall, the zeroth and first only to get the uh, velocity potential for the fluid. And you just integrate it, integrate the momentum in the fluid, and you find, if you do this integral, you obtain an answer, which is mv, where m is defined here. And since what represents the uh, response of the system to a uh, small external for force is, uh, of course, the, the derivative of the total momentum with respect to the velocity. And I see this thing has become hooked inside a cabinet. Uh, okay. Then, uh, <laughs> then, that's not looking too good. Try it this way. Then the, um, then you obtain m, not m naught. Uh, thus, what do we have here? We have a system, something like a particle, our ping pong ball, interacting with a continuum system, in this case, a perfect fluid. And we find the mass of the system as a result of its interactions with the continuum is changed. 
The next time this idea enters physics is in the electron theory of Lorentz, much later in the 19th century, and in Abraham's work on the electron theory of Lorentz. Where um, Lorentz thought of the electron as a rigid body with charge distributed on it of some characteristic radius, R, and carrying a charge, E. And he observed that if one computed the momentum of such a body in steady motion, of course, nowadays we know about relativity and we do it easier just by computing the mass, you would have to the energy content, which is the mass you would obtain a, uh, this seems to be unusually susceptible of hooking today. You seem to, have, one would obtain uh, not only the energy of the body at rest, but also the energy of the attached electrostatic field, which is some constant, depending upon whether it's a spherical shell of charge or a uniformly distributed sphere of charge, times e squared over r. The electrostatic, the electrostatic self-energy of the Coulomb field, e squared, uh, 1 over 8 pi e squared, integrated over all space. If you put the thing in a scale, you are not just weighing the electron, you are weighing the electron and the associated electromagnetic field, and the first thing your scale tells you is the combined mass by e equals mc squared of the two things. Likewise, if you attempt to accelerate the object, you are not only, uh, you, when you set it in steady motion, you are not only moving the electron, you are moving the associated Coulomb field. You don't leave the Coulomb field behind when you give the electron a little push. It moves with it, and therefore you get not just the momentum of the moving M0 rigid body, but also the momentum of the uh, electromagnetic field that moves with it. Thus, in general, whenever we have a particle interacting with a continuum system, its mass is changed from what it would be if the, continue, if the interaction with the continuum system were not present, whether the continuum system is the classical hydrodynamic field or Maxwell's electrodynamics. Any question about this phenomenon? Now let's get no questions. I just love talking about, I, I, we didn't really need this historical introduction. I just can't resist talking about George Green and Stokes. <laughs> now, the, <clears throat> now let's consider our, uh, the theory we have um, to worry about. We have a Lagrangian. I'll just focus for the moment on the meson mass. And in honor of the previous discussion, I'll call the quantity that multiplies phi squared, which I've been calling mu, mu, naught, mu squared before, mu naught squared. Because after all, it is the mass in the absence of any interactions. Minus, yes, thank you. I always make that mistake. Plus the nucleon term that I won't bother to write down at the moment. Now, there's absolutely no reason to believe that in the presence of the interaction, mu naught squared is unquestionably what the meson mass would be if the interaction were turned off, because we solved that theory and we found out it is the meson mass. However, just as interactions with the, uh, electro with the hydrodynamic field or the electromagnetic field, cause the mass of the effective mass of ping pong balls immersed in water or charged shells I mean, interacting with the electromagnetic field to change. So would we expect the interactions with the nucleons to change the mass of the meson. We were actually able to solve this theory exactly. And we looked, for example, for how would I define it objectively? Oh, say the energy of the lowest state with charge zero other than the vacuum. That would be the one meson state with momentum zero. And uh, there's no reason I should find it to be mu naught. It's some dynamically determined number, and it's a complicated computation to figure out what it is. So the actual physical mass of the meson, which I will call mu squared, is in general not equal to mu naught squared. Now, this is not only an interesting phenomenon. It is also a, a problem 
for a scattering theory in the same way the energy mismatch for the vacuum state was a problem for a scattering theory. Because if we arrange matters this way, when we um, turn on um, the interaction adiabatically, the uh, mass and therefore the energy of a single meson state coming in will change, even if it is uh, far from, even if it's just an isolated single state, if it's far from anything. It will develop a phase, just as the vacuum state developed a phase in the course of turning the interaction on and off. And when we compute the one meson to one meson S matrix element, which should be one for the same reason the uh, vacuum to vacuum S matrix element is one, the universe is empty except for a single meson. It's not going to scatter off of anything. It's just going to go on. <laughs> we will not get one, but some preposterous phase factor involving the length of time we've kept the interaction on for. We want to avoid that difficulty. And we avoid that difficulty by introducing counter terms. In particular, I consider the following Lagrangian, which I'll now write down in full. Phi squared um, minus one half mu squared, not mu naught squared. I'm going to be a little bit cleverer than you might have thought. Plus d mu psi star d mu psi <coughs> my plus f of t minus g psi star psi phi. Now I'm going to write first by old-fashioned vacuum counter term, which I still need. I'll come back and make further remarks about that. A. I can't remember whether I called it plus A or minus A before. Oh, let me call it plus A. It doesn't matter. And A. I will now add a counter term here, B over 2 phi squared. And I will add a counter term here, plus C psi star psi. doesn't matter. There's no standard convention about whether A, B, and C are positive and negative. doesn't matter. It's just a matter of definition. How do I choose what are the functions of these B and C counter terms? The functions of these B and C counter terms are to adjust matters so that the mass of the meson stays the same as I turn on the interaction, just as the function of the A counter term is to adjust matters so the vacuum the energy of the vacuum stays the same when I turn on the interaction. That is to say, I start turning on the interaction, the um, mass of the meson begins to change because there's an interaction. Ha! That doesn't bother me. I'll just turn on B at the same time to adjust the bare mass, mu naught squared, keeping in step so that the physical mass always stays mu squared. It's mu squared when the interaction is off, and it's mu squared when the interaction is on. Of course, in the average, I should say it's mu squared in the average sense. I arrange it so that the phase mismatch integrates to zero, just as for the vacuum state, I arrange matters so the phase mismatch integrates to zero. Yes? Um, do you also want to ask terms of the nucleon is not inside of the vacuum Oh, yes. I'm sorry. That was a slip of the chalk. Thank you. Now, hmm? m squared, yes, I'm sorry, I'm being very, very bad. I was thinking of a spinner nucleon for some reason. Um, the, um, now, the three additional terms I have added, a, b, and c, are of course not free parameters. They are completely determined. a is determined by the fact That vacuum S vacuum equals 1. This determines A. If I compute vacuum S vacuum to any order in perturbation theory, then I know A to any order in perturbation theory from that thing. Um, the B counter term is determined by the condition that there be no phase mismatch where this is 1 meson. Let this be this thing, and this determines B completely. 
I compute the phase I would get for one meson to one meson, and I force it to be one. That fixes B. If I've computed that phase to any order in perturbation theory, I have fixed B to that order in perturbation theory. And this, where this is a one nucleon state, unfortunately my notation is not well enough developed so I can simply tell you without writing words that it's a one nucleon state or a one nucleon meson state. And this, uh, it fixes C. Again, to any order in my expansion. Furthermore, not only does this fix these counter terms, I, they are comp principal computable quantities. If I am interested in what is the, assuming this were a realistic theory of the world, and I were interested in the well, rather an interesting question, still a question I can ask, what is the bare mass of the meson if I know its physical mass? Uh, you know, how much of its mass is due to its interactions and how much of its mass was given to it by God before he turned on the interactions? I could compute that bare mass just by, well, I see from this formula, it's uh, mu squared minus b. Mu naught squared is mu squared minus b. And um, uh, m naught squared is m squared minus c. So if I want to compute them, I have a systematic way of computing them order by order in perturbation theory. OK? Yes? How do you know you're just saying three counter terms? Well, I would imagine I have the whole theorem theory is Lorentz invariant. So if there's, oh, I will go on. Uh, certainly I've taken care, so I've certainly taken care of everything as far as the vacuum state goes, the one meson state, and the one nucleon state. I will now go on to the question of whether I need further counterterms. I should make one technical remark that I should have made earlier, but I forgot. Please notice here we have added A to the Hamiltonian density, not to the Hamiltonian as before. The reason is, is this is a homogeneous system in space of infinite spatial extent. So we would expect not to find a finite total energy shift, but a finite a total energy shift per unit volume, just as if we had an infinite crystal and changed the strength of the electromagnetic interactions a tiny bit. The energy of the whole crystal would change by an infinite amount because it's infinite. <laughs> it's the energy per cubic centimeter that we would hope to change by a finite amount. And since this is a spatially infinite system, I have added my counter term to the Hamiltonian density rather than to the Hamiltonian. Secondly, the question that was asked from the, from the room, what is, uh, is this all? Have I gotten rid of all phase mismatches? Well, of course, I can't really tell until I do computations or else put my scattering theory on a firmer foundation than we have now with this dumb f of t function. But it looks plausible because I've now arranged so there's no energy mismatch between uh, the vacuum, interacting vacuum, and the bare vacuum. There's no energy mismatch between a real physical one meson state and a bare one meson state. And there's no energy mismatch between a real physical one nucleon state and a bare one nucleon state. And if I have a scattering state that's uh, 32 mesons and 47 nucleons all coming in in certain wave packets in the far past or the far future, well, I said coming in, so I should say the far past, those 32 mesons and 47 nucleons are all thousands of light years away from each other. So the energy of the, of the multi-particle state is simply the sum of the energies of the single particles. And I've arranged that the energies of the single particles are all coming out OK. So the energy of the multi-particle state has also come out OK. They do get away from each other, even though none of them get away from their own fields. They get away from each other. Okay, that's certainly an empirical fact, that if I have a state of 72 protons very far from each other, the energy of the total state is the sum of the energies of the 72 individual protons. <laughs> so it looks like these three counter terms are sufficient to take care of all of our problems of phase mismatch, and they'll all, they're all we, need, we will need. I mean, we may be making a mistake. Maybe we'll need more. Later on, we'll discover, because we'll put all of scattering theory on a firmer foundation and see just how many we need. But for the moment, things look good. So keeping my fingers crossed, I will run with this Lagrangian. Yes, sir? In the scattering, you can think of the 
I would have a pro I, uh, in this formulation, I cannot take care of scattering from bound states because when I turn the interaction off, the bound states fall apart. Okay, we will need a better formulation of scattering theory to take care of scattering from bound states, and we will have it in a month's time, but we won't have it. We don't have it now. Now, I'm reaching a stage where I need to look at some detailed equations, or else I'll put wrong signs on the board, so let me get out my lecture notes. Well, I see they begin with page 9. Then there's a blank sheet. Then there's eight. <laughs> where am I? Ah, here's where I am. Okay, that's the, this I went through. Okay. I said we'll get to page nine. I'm just on page two. Now, I will now explain what uh, Feynman diagrams are. That takes care of topic one. We know what Lagrangian we have to look at. Now I'm going to talk about the diagrammatic representation of that Lagrangian. Uh, I wish to compute matrix elements of the S matrix between particular states. Remember, every term in the Wick expansion will in general contribute to many independent scattering processes, depending upon whether we use the loose external lines to um, uh, create a particle or annihilate a particle. <clears throat> I would now like to write down matrix elements for, say, to take a particular process, a nucleon with momentum P plus a P1 plus a nucleon with momentum P2 goes into a nucleon with momentum P1 prime plus a nucleon with momentum P2 prime. And I will write down the contribution to uh, the S matrix element there's always a one term so I'll just subtract that out where these are relativistically normalized states that is there will be a variety of Wick diagrams that may contribute to this and I'll write down the ones of order G squared just for uh, Simplicity for the moment, neglecting the effects of the counterterms. I'll talk about the counterterms later. I will indicate these things in the following way. All the fields that are going to annihilate, I will put on the right, where the initial state is that they are going to annihilate. Okay, in my original Wick diagrams, it didn't matter how I had the field sticking out, the external line sticking out from the diagram. I will now orient them. All of the fields that are going to create, I'll put on the left, where the final state is. And then I will uh, label the external lines with the momentum of the particles they are annihilating and creating. Thus, for example, in this process, it is easy to see that there are, well, I'll write down two typical diagrams. There are actually four. There is here, the, I, will, I can use this free nucleon field to annihilate a nucleon of momentum P1, and this one to annihilate a nucleon of momentum P2. I can use this free anti-nucleon field to create P1 prime, and this one to create P2 prime. Thus, the initial state P1, P2 goes into the final state P1 prime, P2 prime. There are, of course, four other ways of doing it, even with this only single Wick diagram. This is just one Wick diagram sitting here in the middle. I could, for example, write an alternative in which I put P2 up here, P1 here, P1 prime, and P2 prime. Here I have used the field at 1 to annihilate the, moment, the nucleon state with momentum P2 and the field at 2 to annihilate the nucleon state with momentum P1, the reverse of the previous situation. These are two separate diagrams, not one four particle scattering diagram. Okay, are the notational conventions clear? Yes? 
Oh, I'm sorry. That was my, uh, that's a slip of the chalk. I get a little palsied as I grow older. Yes, I draw a solid line. Um, now, a very amusing thing happens with, I would like to first discuss the combinatoric factors associated with these kinds of diagrams. And secondly, I would like to discuss the, um, the um, uh, how you actually numerically evaluate them. The um, combinatoric factors are much simpler than they are for Wick diagrams, at least for this theory. The reason is very simple. If we look at diagrams of this sort obtained from this one by permuting the indices, we notice that all the vertices are uniquely labeled, assuming, let me assume for the moment in this case, I should have written that earlier, P1 not equal to P2, and our fortiori P1 prime not equal to P2 prime. P1 could equal P1 prime. I'm not excluding forward scattering. All I'm excluding is scattering at threshold, which is, after all, only a single point, and we can always get to it by continuity. If the two four momentum are equal, you're a threshold in the center of mass frame. The particles are mutually at rest with respect to one another. <clears throat> the, um, this vertex is uniquely labeled as the vertex at which P1 is absorbed. Once I have labeled one vertex uniquely in the diagram, all the other vertices are uniquely labeled in any diagram. This is the vertex you get to by following the meson line from the vertex where P1 is absorbed. If it were an infinitely more complicated diagram, you could just trace through it giving directions. Follow the nucleon line along the arrow, follow the nucleon line against the arrow, follow the meson line. As soon as you label one vertex uniquely, every other vertex is labeled uniquely by such a set of instructions. And this vertex is labeled uniquely. It's the only vertex where P1 is absorbed. Therefore, the corresponding Feynman diagram, the corresponding diagram we would get by permuting one and two would exactly, it would be a different term, still the same term in the Wick expansion, but a completely different contribution, and would therefore precisely cancel out, although of course numerically equal, and would precisely cancel out the two factorial, and in general, the n factorial in a complicated diagram would be canceled out. Therefore, we erase the labeling on the, on the vertices and just the 1 over n factorial disappears. I should say it doesn't disappear everywhere. It disappears unless you are considering a diagram that is a complicated diagram with a disconnected component with no external lines. Because then within that disconnected component, there's nothing that's absorbing anything or emitting anything. And you may have trouble labeling vertices uniquely by the stratagem I have just described. So I should say with disconnected components, with However, this isn't going to trouble us mostly because those disconnected components are just all summed together by the exponentiation theorem to make a numerical factor multiplying the whole expression that's supposed to be canceled by the A counter term anyway. So it doesn't matter if we calculate them right or calculate them wrong, they all sum up to zero. And we need never write them down in the first place. <laughs> Unless, of course, we want to compute the energy per unit volume of the ground state following our computation of last lecture, in which case we do have to keep the combinatoric structure straight. But if we're only interested in computing S matrix elements, all of those things cancel among themselves anyway, and we don't have to worry about them. That takes care of the combinatorics. Are there any questions? The 
1 over n factorial in Dyson's formula always is, for this theory, is always completely canceled for diagrams of this sort. And diagrams of this sort, without labeled indices, but with label, without labeled vertices, but with labeled ends, are called Feynman diagrams. Yes, sir. What is the in which Oh, well, for example, if I had a 5 fourth interaction, OK, then I would have trouble because I would have identical lines emerging from each vertex. And I would have to think a little bit more carefully. I couldn't say, follow the meson line as you go along, because then you would have to ask, which meson line? OK? If there were three meson, if were five fourth theory, there would be four meson lines coming out of each vertex, and they all look the same. And you followed one in, and then I say, follow the meson line out. And you say, which meson line? There are three going out. <laughs> OK, so if there are more than, you, you can get into trouble that way. You can, uh, you can have residual combinatoric factors left over in those cases. But I chose a model that's nice. Fortunately, quantum electrodynamics and meson nucleon theory, about which we will spend a lot of time, are very similar in their combinatoric structure, and they're also the 1 over n factorials disappear. However, if you're dealing with a 5 4 theory, you have to worry a little more. You may have leftover symmetry numbers, even in Feynman diagrams. Other questions? Now we come to the actual evaluation of these diagrams. If I do one of them, you will see how all of them go. So let me do 1A. Firstly, we have to compute the amplitude for uncorrected, uncontracted fields absorbing and emitting a meson and a nucleon. That amplitude is very straightforward because we have relativistically normalized states, which have a 2 pi to the 3 half square root of 2 omega p in their normalization. And now you see why I put in that dumb 2 pi to the 3 halves, which has been puzzling you for a month, because that guarantees that if I take the free field, say, and look at its matrix element to annihilate a single nucleon, that is simply e to the minus i p dot x. And I shouldn't have put the arrow there. That was what the 2 pi to the 3 halves was there for in my state normalization, <laughs> to make sure that I wouldn't have any 2 pi to the 3 halves in my Feynman rules, which I'm going to derive. Likewise, for absorption of a meson, emission of a nucleon, emission of an antinucleon, et cetera. So what do we have, say, the contribution to s minus 1? I subtract out the 1. just. Well, OK, worried about that. There's no diagram for it, so I'll write things for s minus 1 from diagram A. Well, I have, firstly, it's still going to be an integral over two points, which I'll call d4x1, d4x2. I have a. Um, Minus i g squared, I've canceled out the n factorial, but I haven't canceled out the g. If I restore the indices for a moment, just so you'll know what integration variable I'm calling 1 and what integration variable I'm calling 2, I absorb a nucleon with momentum p1 at 1. So that gives me e to the minus i p1 dot x1. And I absorb one with momentum 2 at 2. I emit one with momentum p prime. That's the coefficient of, an, of a creation operator at x1, p1 prime. x2. And in between, that takes care of all the loose, uncontracted fields. I still have phi of x1. 5x2. Does everyone agree that's the contribution of diagram A? Yes, sir. Uh, two equivalent diagrams. I'll now erase the 1 and 2. 
Okay, I just had to label them something, so you see, I could have called them X and Y or something like that. Okay, that's the contribution, the actual matrix element between these relativistically normalized states of this particular term in the Wick expansion, where we use the operator at this vertex to annihilate the meson with nucleon with momentum P1, et cetera. Now, phi of x1, phi of x2 is, of course, an object for which we have a rather simple expression. Integral d4q over 2 pi to the fourth e to the i q dot, how will I arrange it? x1 minus x2, it doesn't matter. i over q squared minus mu squared plus i epsilon. Now, if we insert this expression in the preceding one, we notice that a great simplification occurs because all of the x integrals are trivial. They simply give us delta functions. All we're left with is the q integral, which will also turn out to be trivial. So this thing up here, I'll just call it a, the contribution of diagram a, a equals, we still have minus ig squared. Instead of the double integral over space, we have the single integral over the single internal line, d4q over 2 pi to the fourth. We have this expression sitting here. Epsilon. And we have a, from doing the x1 integral, we have a delta function with times 2 pi to the fourth. P1 plus P2 minus Q. From doing the X2 integral, we have 2 pi to the fourth, delta 4 of Q minus P1 prime minus P2 prime. This is obviously uh, completely general. I could have been out working on a much more complicated diagram. What's not general is that I can now trivially do the Q integral, and I will, or I'll leave it for you to do. Whenever I have a vertex like this, oh, something important. I've left out f of t. I should have said that earlier. Since I think I've taken a care of, I think, not heavily on wood, we'll talk about it later, I've taken account of all the residual effects that with my renormalization counter terms that come from uh, f of t, I have now set f of t to 1 immediately. Later on, we will worry a great deal about whether we have made an error by doing that at this stage. But to simplify matters, I will do things now. <coughs> I have to immediately go on to the limit f of t equals 1. And so it looks like a nice limit so far. It doesn't look like I've gotten into any trouble by doing that. <laughs> now, we can see that this, what, what the operation here is, in fact, completely general. I could do this to a diagram of arbitrary complexity. All I have to do is take my diagram and assign momenta to every internal line, which, some, which I give some orientation. In this case, I've oriented the momentum q, so I can think of it as going from 1 to 2. If I'd written things in the other way, it would go from 2 to 1. For every internal line, so let me write down now the famous Feynman rules for this theory. Cunningly erasing the Lagrangian, which I didn't want to do. But. For every, there is a factor for every internal meson line. Which looks like this, carrying some momentum, Q. I will have a factor 
integral d4q over 2 pi to the fourth i over q squared minus mu squared plus i epsilon. <clears throat> For every internal nucleon line, what? No, it's a meson line. Q is oriented one way or the other. I can't specify. Uh, you know, you, you choose it arbitrarily. It doesn't matter. It's for every internal meson line, nucleon, <clears throat> carrying some momentum P, I'll have a factor d4P over 2 pi to the fourth i over p squared minus m squared plus i epsilon. No question there. It's the same thing. Of course, if I have 72 internal meson lines and 37 internal nucleon lines, I have a q1 to q72 and a p1 to p37. For every vertex, yeah, yeah, chill. I'll write the vertex this way so you'll know the orientation. P, Q, P prime. I have a factor minus I, G coming from my uh, minus I, G expansion. 2 pi to the fourth times an energy momentum conserving delta function. As I've oriented them, suppose I've oriented them in the sign indicated where P goes this way, Q goes this way, and P prime goes that way, is P prime minus P minus Q. Of course, if I've oriented them in a different way, then the signs of the various terms get changed. It depends how I've oriented them. But the idea is if you think of momentum flowing around the diagram like current flowing around an electrical circuit, you have conservation at every vertex. The amount of momentum that flows in is the amount of momentum that flows out. This is it, aside from the counterterm vertices. If it weren't for the counterterms, I could stop here. OK? That's it. That's every diagram. You just take all of this stuff, stick it together, and you get a big integral. The extra, everything is fixed is by uh, you know, what's going on at the external lines and so on. It's all a function of the momentum on the external lines, which affects the momentum on the internal lines via these delta functions. Counter terms are pretty trivial. I won't bother to write down what happens for the um, A counter term. That's just a number. I don't need a special diagrammatic rule for that. But for the two mass counter terms, that's the uh, C type counter term. That gives me my uh, plus I, I guess, because I see with a plus sign Lagrangian and it's minus I H plus I C 2 pi to the fourth delta fourth of P prime minus P. And for the meson counter term, which I'll also indicate with an x, I have plus ib 2 pi to the fourth, delta fourth of q prime minus q. The Uh, the minor technical point here, you might think there was a one-half because the term in the interaction Hamiltonian is one-half B phi squared. But you have two possible terms, which phi you are going to contract in the forward direction as you move along this line and which phi you are going to contract in the backward direction. There are always two choices there, and those two choices cancel out the one-half. Are there any questions about these rules? They are very simple. 
They are also cleverly arranged. This enables you directly to compute the S matrix element to any arbitrary order in perturbation theory between any set of relativistically normalized states with any number of incoming mesons and any number of out, out, uh, nucleons and any number of outgoing mesons and nucleons. We just draw all possible diagrams with the appropriate number of vertices. Write down for each of these diagrams an expression given by these rules and do the integrals to the best of your ability. I will say a moment. In many cases, the integrals are trivial. In other cases, they're complicated. Yes, Pierre, you had a question? Yeah, well, Ooh. No, they're 2 pi to the fourth. No, they didn't. Oh. Oh, you mean I've got the order wrong? Oh, 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 yes, right, you're quite right. I'm sorry. P1 prime is going out. Q, let's say, is going out, and, P2, and uh, P1 is coming in. Yes, and then in the other vertex, it's, um, sorry about that. Yeah, I'm glad you caught me on that. It's been extraordinarily dumb. Uh, P1 is coming in. No, P2 is coming in, and Q is coming in since it was going out of the other vertex, and P1 prime is going, and P2 prime is going up. That's right. I'm sorry. Thank you. Now, Okay, but aside from that slip on my part, these are, it's, this is a, in agreement with the rule I wrote here. It's the momentum at a given vertex that is summed up. As far as, so now we can forget Wick's theorem. We can forget, I hope you'll remember, because we'll come back to it later, but for the time being, we can forget Wick's theorem. We can forget Dyson's formula. We can forget fields. All we have is a sequence of rules, like the rules of arithmetic, for computing any, any contribution to any order in this field theory of any scattering process. And please notice these rules have been arranged so that to take care of one of the important practical problems of theoretical physics to with keeping track of the two pies. There is no two pi anywhere in these rules Aside from a 1 over 2 pi for every integral d dp and a 2 pi for every delta function. Therefore, even if you cancel by eyeball delta functions against integrals by doing trivial integrations, you are still left with the rule. You will have a 2 pi for every leftover delta function and a 1 over 2 pi for every integral. <laughs> okay, it's always that way. There is no problem keeping track of the 2 pi's. Because there's some left over. Hmm? No, unfortunately, we cannot scale things. The Tennessee legislature, wasn't it, or West Virginia tried to do that? <laughs> they decided to make, make life simple for engineers. They would declare that in the state of Tennessee, pi was equal to three. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that's true or if it's just a, uh, a, a slander, but it's a well, <laughs> frequently told story. Now, of course, in most of our cases, there are people. People make rough orders of magnitude estimates. They set the two pi is equal to 1. And that's therefore, sometimes they've discovered they've left out a 2 pi to the fourth and have told an experimentalist that a result is liable to occur 2 pi to the eighth times more frequently <laughs> than, in fact, it is predicted to occur. And that makes people very unhappy. So it's good to keep track of the two pi. Yeah. Maybe Which one? This one or this yeah, one? Oh, I'm sorry. That was a slip of the jaw. No. It's a side star side interaction. Yeah? Yeah, they're vertices, and this is the rule for attaching to them. These are primitive vertices, if you will, and these are counterterm vertices. B and C are, of course, infinite power series in the coupling constant, and I will explain to you shortly how we determine them order by order. I've explained to you crudely. Now, a few words. 
Uh, most diagrams like this that we have written down so far, like this diagram, of course, all of the internal momentum are fixed by the energy momentum conserving delta functions. So in fact, it's trivial, as it is in this case, to completely get rid of all the internal integrals and just be left with one overall delta function expressing overall energy momentum conservation, something we should expect to appear in our S-matrix element for a space-time translational invariant theory. On the other hand, one can have write-down diagrams where, um, say, one of this structure where the momentum are not fixed completely by energy momentum conservation considerations. In particular, if I have any, any, any energy momentum conserving assignment of internal uh, momenta, I can always add an extra momenta going around this loop at plus p to this line and minus p to this line, and then everything is still conserved. So in those cases, diagrams that have internal closed loops will still have residual integrals, and they will Let me slant this line a bit and say a real external nucleon comes along and emits a virtual meson with momentum Q, changing its momentum to P1 prime. The virtual meson then propagates along until it is absorbed by the second nucleon and changing its momentum from P2 to P2 prime. Et cetera, in this complicated process, in the course of going along, the virtual meson splits into a virtual nucleon and antinucleon, which then recombine to make a virtual meson, which then hits the second original nucleon. There's obviously a one-to-one -one effect, a one-to-many, because how we say forward in time and backward in time for the internal lines is purely a matter of taste. There's a, for any such diagram, one can attach such a metaphorical interpretation. And we sometimes attach words to it. We say these virtual processes conserve energy and momentum because of the delta function, four-dimensional delta function that appears at every vertex. But um, the funny thing about virtual particles is that they need not be on the mass shell. They can have any four momentum, and you have to integrate over all possible four momentum, giving this factor. This interpretation is due to Feynman, who, in fact, by fiddling around, by a miracle, got these rules before Dyson and Wick and any of those things. Not by a miracle. The miracle was genetic, by being a genius. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. the, and, uh, for this reason, these functions here, which, so to speak, uh, uh, represent, uh, give you the probability amplitude in this metaphorical language for the virtual particle going from here to here, are called propagators. They tell you how the virtual particle propagates, and therefore this thing is called a propagator. Feynman propagator. The language, I stress, is purely metaphorical. If you don't want to use it, don't use it, but then you'll find 90% of the physicists in the world will be unintelligible to you when they give seminars. It's very convenient, but it should not be taken too seriously. We have derived these rules without any talk about virtual particles and summing up probability amplitudes for the propagation of virtual particles. We've derived them just from the standard operations of non-relativistic quantum mechanics and a lot of combinatorics. Yes, sir, you have a question. If you're trying to, to uh, make a model that really has something resembles reality, how do you know what uh, fair versions, what fair versions put in? Like, you can get a, a five-four. Yeah, sure. Uh, this experiment. Uh, how do I know that the interaction between uh, electrons is in, in, you could have asked the same question in classical mechanics. <clears throat> how, do you, how do you know, Mr. Newton, that it's a 1 over r squared force rather than an r force, as Mr. Hook suggests? <laughs> no, it's hardly unambiguous. It's unambiguous if the couplings are weak and you can do perturbation theory. If the couplings are strong and perturbation theory is useless, then you don't. Then there are. Then it's uh, not at all unambiguous, and you know it's a very hard job that's still in progress to try and figure out what is the theory that explains the strong interactions. In the second term, we'll discuss all kinds of ways of getting predictions of a rather limited sort without knowing much about the detailed shape of the Lagrangian methods based on things called dispersion relations and current algebra and SU3 symmetry to pick three methods out at random. But in general, nobody knows what the, we, we all have our favorite ideas, but uh, it's, 
what the actual law of interaction is because uh, we can't do perturbation theory calculations with any reliability when the dimensionless coupling constant is on the order of 15, which happens to be the case for the meson-nucleon interaction. And therefore, we don't know. On the other hand, electrodynamics, we know because we can make the coupling constant as weak, we can make the predictions, and we can check that the Lagrangian we have written down describes reality. Are there further questions? <clears throat> now, I would now like to systematically begin systematically going through all the Feynman diagrams that arise in our model theory to order g squared. I won't finish it in this lecture, but I'll go through them one at a time, and I would like to discuss with each of them there will be a little point of physics, even though there are, as I recall, well, see, uh, one, two, seven, 16, there are 23 of them, but uh, they come together in families. It's not so bad. So we now come to a lecture called 23 Feynman Diagrams, all diagrams for all processes allowed by energy momentum conservation that occur up to order g squared in our theory. Yeah. Order g diagrams. Those are simple because there are only two. I won't bother to write on the external, what the actual values of the external momenta are until it is time to compute things. This represents the decay of a meson into a nucleon-antinucleon pair. It is a diagram of order G, and it is zero, unless we are so stupid as to write down our fundamental you choose our, our, original, our physical mass of the meson to be larger than twice the mass of the nucleon. I will talk later about what happens when we do make that choice, but for the moment I will assume we have not made it. Our meson is stable and there is a genuine asymptotic meson state, in which case that diagram vanishes by energy momentum conservation. Since there's no way of arranging matter, so me or any of the other process, a real nucleon decays into a real nucleon and a real meson all on the mass shell. Also well known to be impossible, no matter how we choose the masses. <laughs> <coughs> Diagram two is even stupider. That represents the vacuum spontaneously emitting a, or absorbing a meson. And that is also equal to zero by energy momentum conservation because of the big fat delta fun energy momentum conserving delta function that comes out in front, and we need not worry about it. Okay, those are the two diagrams of order G. Now we go on to order G squared. One. This is diagram one above doubled. It's two mesons decaying. <laughs> and is again equal zero if mu is, is less than 2m. It's a diagram. That's the one with the most external lines. It has six external lines. I'll now start counting at the other end and go up from zero external lines to none. Two. Is this a contribution to the vacuum energy? Fortunately, along with it, there is two prime, which is this, the A term. And the condition that fixes the A term is that the sum is zero. That is to say that the vacuum to vacuum amplitude has no corrections. Thus, yes, sir. Well, I'm not exactly sure what that, what that means. Just, just writing down the H term. Well, there's a contribution. It's just as in the previous problem, in problem two. There's a vacuum self-energy correction, but there's an A term, and in the exponential, they're chosen to cancel. Okay, I wrote a single cross for the A term. Okay. 
sum to zero. They're chosen to sum to zero. Those are the only contributions to order g squared to vacuum s vacuum, and a vacuum s vacuum is supposed to be zero to order g squared. It's one to order one and zero. And that's one diagram that was to second order. Yeah, sec I, of course, the A term is an infinite power series. I'm only interested in the second order term and its expansion. Of course, this determines the A term to second order in G, not to higher orders in G. So if I wanted to know the vacuum energy per unit volume to second order in G, I would know it from this diagram. What? Oh, right you are. Left it off. Sorry. I've also hooked myself again. Okay, right. Doesn't affect what I said. Thank you, John. <laughs> it's only a single line. That's right, there's also this. And the bracket goes down further. <laughs> it's not 27, it's 28. I forgot a diagram. <laughs> now, onwards. Diagrams with one external line. Three and three prime. Well, that's interesting if I want to compute the bare mass of the nucleon to order g squared. But if I don't, my renormalization condition, the condition that fixes, so I shouldn't have said renorm, yeah, the condition that fixes the mass renormalization counter term is precisely the condition that these two diagrams sum to zero. Before, if they didn't, there would be a non-zero correction of order g squared to the one nucleon to one nucleon matrix element. Two external lines, I'm sorry. There's always an even number of external lines if there are two vertices. <coughs> Onwards, four and four prime. The same story for a meson and the same answer. Now we are left only with the diagrams with, <coughs> we see we've gone through a large number of Feynman diagrams with hardly any labor. <laughs> but um, we now have to compute the diagrams with four external lines. Such uh, diagrams will, of course, uh, have two vertices and one internal line. And they will contribute to a wide variety of processes, which I will write down. Does everyone have these Feynman rules in their heads? Or, well, if you don't, you'll see many examples of them. Everyone should remember this. This was a homework problem, and this is the same thing. And this is just minus IG times an energy momentum conserving delta function. And as I'll argue shortly, we won't have to worry about the counter terms now. And there are five, pro four processes uh, well, a larger number, actually, seven processes that um, can, be, uh, can occur with two diagrams with four external lines. Of course, two of them must be incoming or two and two outgoing. Otherwise, energy momentum conservation will make them vanish trivially. You cannot have a single particle go into three. So, uh, or the vacuum go into four. So I'll write down these processes, and then afterwards I will write down the diagrams. We could have nucleon-nucleon scattering. We could also have anti-nucleon-anti-nucleon scattering, but that's connected by C, since our theory does have charge conjugation invariance. So I'm not going to bother to discuss anti-nucleon, anti-nucleon scattering, since it's diagram for diagram identical with nucleon, nucleon scattering. We could have nucleon, anti-nucleon scattering. C doesn't help me much there. We could have nucleon, meson scattering. That's, of course, connected by C to anti-nucleon meson scattering. I also only write down the ones that conserve charge. Remember, the nucleons have charge 1, the mesons have charge 0. 
<coughs> and finally, we could have nucleon antinucleon annihilation into meson plus meson, and that is connected by T to uh, meson plus meson makes a nucleon antinucleon pair. So I won't bother to write that one down. Thus, we have four processes to consider, for each of which we will find two Feynman diagrams, which we will have to sum up. And I would like to write down for all of those four processes, those two Feynman diagrams, eight Feynman diagrams in all, and discuss the physical meaning of each term in the perturbation expansion, because each one has an interesting physical meaning. Um, in order to simplify matters, since I know I will always get an overall energy momentum conserving delta function, I will, in order to keep from perpetually writing down a delta functions, I will always write P1 prime, P2 prime, where those are the final momentum of whatever the particles are. S minus 1, P1, P2 equals I, that's there by a dumb convention to agree with non-relativistic quantum mechanics definition of the scattering amplitude, but everyone puts it there, so I will. Delta 4, P1 plus P2 minus P1 prime minus P2 prime times A from the final initial state to the final state, and I will just write down A, the scattering amplitude. So I won't have to perpetually write down delta functions. A is called the invariant scattering amplitude. It has got the delta function factored out. Sure. That's the setup. Now I go, beginning with nucleon, nucleon scattering, and going through into next lecture with the other processes. Are there questions about what I've done so far? Yes? vacuum bubbles disappear. No, they're all of order g squared. That's order g fourth. Oh, you mean this one? Oh, yes, I left. I keep leaving that out. That's dumb of me. Let's see, it occurs. Yeah. There's a three double prime here. Oh, I didn't even mean that one. I meant, <laughs> <laughs> I meant where the thing just goes through. Mm -hmm. And disconnected from that is any of your vacuum bubbles. Yeah, and they're of course each ca all canceled by the eight terms. I don't just bother to write. I don't bother to write them down. We could have the disconnected. All the disconnected vacuum bubbles and omitted the eight term. Yeah. Period, as including the eight term. Either because the eight term is designed to cancel them all whenever they occur. Yeah, the I is there by definition. The I is there by definition, so our relativistic scattering amplitude will have the same phase of the F of energy and cosine theta that is defined in all non-relativistic quantum mechanics books. It's a convention I. I would be just as happy if the convention were otherwise, but I'm not going to change all the literature. <laughs> I once gave a course in which I adamantly refused to put in that dumb eye by convention and proved op optical theorems for the real parts of scattering amplitudes. And <laughs> it got pretty silly. It got pretty silly at the end. So <laughs> I put it in. I put it in. <laughs> okay. Now let's go with number five.
these are the two diagrams I have written down before. By the way, people who are tired of always writing P's whenever they write a diagram sometimes leave the P's off this diagram. And to let you know two of them are exchanged in the other one, they sometimes write this one, stealing a notational device from electrical engineering. Oops. That's a rather sloppy way. Oh, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> to indicate that the momenta, you're to put in the momenta by yourself and put them in the same places on the two diagrams. <laughs> then it will take care of itself. <laughs> so that's the same diagram, just written with the lines twisted around. Now, <clears throat> All of, our del all of our internal momenta are fixed, so there are no leftover integrations and no leftover delta functions, except the one leftover delta function for overall energy momentum conservation, which we have left. Therefore, the internal momentum here is fixed by the delta function to be P1 minus P1 prime, or equivalently P2 minus P2 prime. They're the same. And the one here is fixed to be P1 minus P2 prime. The only thing we have left, there are no delta functions. There are no internal integrations to do. There are no two pi's left. So we have, in this case, IA. Both of these diagrams are second order. So I have a minus IG squared. And all I have left is the Feynman propagator for the meson. I over P1 minus P1 prime squared minus mu squared plus i epsilon plus i from the second diagram p1 minus p2 prime squared minus mu squared plus i epsilon. That's it. Wasn't it easy? That's right. That's precisely right. Because here, energy momentum conservation says the momentum here is P1 minus P2 prime. And here it says P1 minus P1 prime. Otherwise, they wouldn't be different diagrams. <laughs> OK, that's the unique expression. That's all there is to it. <clears throat> now, um, of course, the eyes are literally no problem. They combine together to make just an overall minus one, A with the mi is minus 1 times that whole thing. But I would now like to discuss the meaning of these two terms. Because after all, relativistic quantum mechanics is, among other things, supposed to approach non-relativistic quantum mechanics in the low energy regime. And we have all done, I hope, many per Born approximation perturbation theory computations in non-relativistic quantum mechanics. And have we ever seen an expression like this before? <laughs> okay. Well, it's easiest to see in the center of mass frame. In the center of mass frame, where the two momentum of the incoming particle and a fortiori the two momentum of the outgoing particle are equal and opposite. I'll go on for five minutes and then I'll stop. P1 has well, this is the magnitude of the vector p, square root of p squared plus m squared p. <coughs> p2 is square root of p squared plus m squared minus p. The energies are the same. p1 prime is the same dumb energy, some vector p prime of the same magnitude. P2 prime is the same dumb energy <coughs> minus P prime. The denominator factors are P1 minus P1 prime quantity squared is simply, these two terms cancel. So I simply get minus P minus P prime squared which is p squared, 2p squared, 1 minus the cosine of the scattering angle theta, or, sorry, minus 2p squared 1, or it is sometimes called minus delta squared, where delta is the momentum transfer. That's familiar non-relativistic kinematic definitions. 
<coughs> P1 minus P2 prime squared is minus from our metric convention P plus P prime quantity squared is minus 2P squared magnitude of P. 1 plus cosine theta, or as it is sometimes called, minus the cross momentum transfer, the momentum transfer that would arise if you consider, uh, if you considered the particle we have arbitrarily labeled as 2 as the descendant of the particle we have labeled as 1, rather than 1 being the descendant of 1. P vector squared. Oh, sorry, script P squared equals P vector squared equals P prime vector squared. Okay, is this kinematics clear to everyone? This is a uh, rather dull part of the, of the talk, so you can ask questions if you don't understand the kinematics. Substituting this in, we find in the center of mass frame, it's Lorentz invariant, so we might as well in the center, do it in the center of mass frame, all the i's and minus signs cancel. g squared, 1 over delta squared plus mu squared. I can now drop the i epsilon, since that's obviously positive, plus 1 over delta cross squared plus mu squared. This is the same expression. Oh, I see what's wrong. OK, now it won't happen anymore. The, uh, this is the same expression as we obtained. Uh, this is the same identical expression, just written in a special coordinate frame. It should now look much more familiar to you. As you may recall, the famous Born approximation of uh, non-relativistic scattering theory says the scattering amplitude is proportional with some kinematic factors that I'm not going to keep straight until the next lecture to integral e to the minus i delta dot r v of r d cubed r. You all remember that, I hope. That's the Born approximation of the lifeblood of non-relativistic scattering theory. <laughs> of course, this equals, by a calculation we did last time, 1 over delta squared plus mu squared, or I should say it's proportional to, I'm not caring about the ties, if v equals g squared e to the minus mu r over r. Thus, this is precisely what we have obtained in lowest non-trivial order in perturbation theory in our relativistic problem. At least the first term is precisely what we would have obtained if we had done non-relativistic perturbation theory to lowest non-trivial order to compute the scattering amplitude for Yukawa potential. This is in perfect agreement with what we discovered last lecture, where we found that what we would now describe in our Feynman language as the exchange of a virtual meson between two static sources produced a Yukawa potential. Therefore, here the exchange of a virtual meson between two moving sources, two actual particles, produces a scattering amplitude that would be produced in this order of perturbation theory by a Yukawa potential. Okay. What about the second term, where delta is replaced by delta cross? Well, you know if you've done non-relativistic scattering theory involving Bose, pa Bosch particles, where uh, the, uh, you have to take account of the symmetry, it's very convenient to introduce something called the exchange operator. The exchange operator is an operator which, when acting on a two-particle wave function, exchanges the two particles. 
if we consider a non-relativistic scattering problem in which h equals h naught plus v of r, where r is the distance between the two particles, plus v of r e, a so-called exchange potential, then the v of r term will give you this, and the v of r e term, because the exchange operator exchanges the two initial particles, here they are exchanged, will turn delta into delta cross, or cosine theta in the center of mass frame, into minus cosine theta in the center of mass frame. It's two ways of saying the same thing. So this term would come from a Yukawa, ordinary Yukawa potential. And this term would come from an exchange Yukawa potential. Of course, the fact that we get both a Yukawa potential and an exchange Yukawa potential is not surprising because these are identical particles. The scattering amplitude must be invariant under the interchange of P1 prime and P2 prime. That is to say, if this term is present, this term must be present. Because there is no way of telling the configuration where you have exchanged the particles from the configuration where you have not exchanged the particles. And since we are working in a formulation of many particle theory, quantum field theory, where both statistics is automatic. Therefore, it must automatically come out having the right symmetry property. The first term, the presence of the first term, demands the presence of the second. That takes care of nucleon-nucleon scattering. I will now do similar arguments, or rather, next lecture, I will begin doing similar arguments. I want to announce what's going on next lecture before you all go away. I will do similar arguments for nucleon, anti-nucleon uh, scattering, where we'll find some things rather like this and some different things, and on for the other three processes. And then I will discuss some mysterious connections that exist between these processes. In particular, I will discuss crossing on TCP on the level of second order perturbation theory. And I will... Uh, then uh, go on to a dull but unfortunately necessary kinematic exercise of how to connect S matrix elements to cross sections, which are what experimentalists publish, after all. <laughs> <laughs>